Okay, and uh, let's just talk a little, a little bit more about the side in, in more detail. So again, you establish that ideal vision, and then you work backwards to operationalize it. What resources do you need? Uh, what degrees do you need? Uh, what do you have to do to actually achieve it? Uh, and another uh, good way to do that is to walk in the shoes of users. That is uh, the idea of centering your ideal vision around users. Uh, walk in the shoes of users. Uh, and uh, if you were a user, for example, approaching a library, what would be your ideal experience starting from um, the road? Um, identifying, uh, seeing a nice, beautiful sign that says the library is here, free parking, um, easy accessible parking, uh, walk into the front door, walk in the shoes of users and, and paint your ideal experience. Um, and, and that will uh, go a long way into uh, creating a, a realistic uh, ideal vision uh, for the second secret. And uh, this is very similar to uh, a very similar process to helping create a mission and vision statement uh, for, for the organization as deciding, um, you know, again, uh, being facetious what you want to be when you grow up. Uh, also, uh, it helps you by walking through the shoes of users, identify what customers might need. Um, and also, uh, by doing that, it also helps establish uh, whether certain customers fit uh, or do not. So it helps you, again, uh, narrow your demographics and understand what you want to be strong in and also understand um, certain um, customers or, or certain needs that will fall outside of that scope. So again, discover is comparing your ideal with what users actually want, uh, and that uh, very typically is a needs assessment, which we will be doing uh, starting in about a month or so, uh, and really will be a semester-long uh, project. Uh, needs assessment uh, really identifies formally what the needs are of the organization and its various uh, constituents. And then deliver, uh, as we discussed uh, previously, uh, deliver plus one. Um, is again to exceed uh, as, as, as several meetings um, deliver plus one as far as one percent improvement. If you think about that one percent improvement by day by week, um, you know across a year can be substantial um, improvement. So, for example, one percent a week even uh, is uh, fifty-two weeks, fifty over fifty percent improvement in, in a year's time. Uh, you could see how by taking small steps, again like something like um, losing weight or eating healthier or um, calling our parents or uh, whatever, um, uh, being uh, more you know conscientious. If you think about just taking small uh, incremental steps, you can see how you can improve majorly in a lot of different areas quickly if you focused. Uh, the other uh, aspect of the lower plus one is to exceed expectations. So really um, taking uh, a look at the bare minimum requirements of anything uh, and then adding a plus one to it. Uh, and again, uh, in, in the examples of raving fans, those are nuances, um, as well as um, we're going to talk about the second, really de delivering things on a consistent basis. And that really is the, the next uh, bullet, uh, is that the true earmark of uh, excellence in delivering plus one and exceeding expectations is really consistently delivering quality experiences. So the example I brought uh, up with Chick-fil-A, uh, regardless of the Chick-fil-A that I go to across uh, the southeast, um, it always is amazing that uh, the experience is uh, always pretty consistent. I did have one bad experience, and that is one singular experience uh, outside of Charlotte, uh, but outside of that, the consistency is always there. Uh, the other aspect of the consistency, however, is offering your employees flexibility and your policies flexibility to evolve as needed or to even be um, not adhered to on a case-by-case case case -case basis uh, if it fits the situation. So the idea of consistency and flexibility is to have... Um, the type of policies and systems in place uh, where regardless of what shift, or what day, what location, the consistency of service and quality of product is always there. Not a lot, not e easier said than done and we'll be working and talking about that throughout the semester as far as how, as far as how to set something like that up. Uh, and then also um, having uh, a modest set of policies so that your employees have uh, um, maximum autonomy 
and creativity and flexibility to uh, meet the needs of users. And Johnny the Bag Boy is a perfect example of the plus one exceeding expectations and really the power of how one person can can make So one after all this idealistic talk, one could ask um, oneself, is this really meaningful? And if you just shoved all this out of the way, why can't we just do what we think is best? And hopefully I think the answer to that question is that uh, what we think is best uh, will almost guaranteedly not necessarily uh, fit with everyone else. So that's the reason why um, truly good quality leadership and management um, is all about understanding the needs of the collective group and that really does uh, hearken to um, our republic and, and the democratic principles that guides our society. Um, you can't just do what you think is best. You must understand the perspectives and take the time and effort to get to know and understand those perspectives of others. And do we always know what's best for our patrons and customers? Again, uh, the answer is certainly no. We might think so, uh, and we might learn to uh, be more than likely right, but we can never guarantee that we know what's best for our patrons or customers. And it also... The question begs to be asked, do customers themselves actually know, always know what's best for them? And the answer is no, again. Uh, and uh, that's, again, what I like about First Break All the Rules is really the first three, uh, the first two secrets in particular really focus on an interaction effect between an expert in the field, uh, i.e. a librarian or information scientist, uh, and the patrons or users that we're trying to serve, and really... Um, uh, mixing both our expertise and visions of what we believe are ideal services with the uh, expectations and wants of uh, users and patrons. And at times it will mean two things. One, that we will educate them to resources and ways of thinking and doing that they were not even aware of. And two, uh, it might lead to uh, a refusal of service um, in a very gentle sense that uh, we simply can't provide that service or cannot serve you either based on the fact that what you're requesting is uh, not within the scope of what we're good at, or two, uh, the individual is being rude or unreasonable based on um, you know, written standards and guidelines. So certainly behavior and refusal of service is always a guideline and policy, uh, which we'll talk about later in the semester, that it should be on the books, allowing your... Um, your employees uh, and the organization to be able to be clear on when a review of service is necessary. Um, and what I've learned in my own experience, um, I used to be a crisis counselor and obviously in my leadership and management experience, um, there's nothing wrong with, in fact, it's very important to set boundaries as far as what is unacceptable behavior and will lead to refusal of service. And certainly being rude, um, uh, using profanity, uh, anything like that that's outside of the ordinary or really extraordinarily outside of the ordinary uh, are, are immediate um, um, uh, reasons for refusal. All right, let's talk about first break all the rules. The title, the title comes from the author's perspective and really their um, conclusion that uh, a lot of the traditional leadership and management um, theory uh, that we view as common sense, in fact, are not. And so really what they're saying is that if you want to become a great leader and manager, the first thing you must do is break a lot of those traditional uh, misconceptions. For example, uh, do not believe that anyone can achieve anything. So the idea that, that everybody can be equally as good or strong in everything is, in fact, a fallacy. The fact that you don't want to always continuously improve on people and focus on the weaknesses. Their emphasis is to focus on the strengths. The idea that, in fact, you consistently disregard the golden rule, which, of course, makes many of us uh, cringe since uh, we were um, brought up on the golden rule, but they introduced the concept of the platinum rule, uh, which is instead of uh, the golden rule, which is due on the others as we uh, would like, um, the, go the platinum rule is um, to do on the others as they would like. Uh, and really, uh, in a global plural society, uh, that makes a lot more sense because what is good for us and what we would prefer uh, may, ne may not necessarily apply to other people. 
Uh, and so uh, they suggest the platinum rule. And we'll talk about that. Um, the fact that excellent managers play favorites, uh, in particular um, playing favorites for their top performers. And uh, their emphasis is that your team should uh, perform consistently at high levels if you follow or consistently break these rules, have, have lower turnover, and have customers and users flock to you. Um, so, uh, again, very provocative, uh, but I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, already feel that uh, there's a lot of uh, logic um, and intuitive sense behind um, breaking of these rules. Uh, in particular, uh, if you haven't had a chance to go to the Langford and Cisco example on page 25, it really talks about what a culture uh, run by these principles, good principles, might look like.